On our next example, we're going to take a look at a function we've seen many, many times, f of x equals x squared. We'll prove whether or not it is uniformly continuous. And you might think that it is because it's a nice, smooth polynomial, and polynomials are beautiful functions to work with in calculus. Um, in fact, I'll spoiler, spoiler alert, we're going to prove that it's not uniformly continuous. So the question is f of x x equals x squared uniformly continuous on its domain, which is all real numbers. Uh, this is kind of deformed a little bit, but this looks something like f of x equals x squared, at least from zero on for the positive values of x. And I chose two points, x1 and x2. Now, in order to be continuous or uniformly continuous, any, eps any epsilon that is given to us, let me, let me draw an epsilon in here. Let me make it about, on this screen, I'm going to make it about one inch. So this will be f of x plus epsilon, and one inch below it, that's going to be f of x minus epsilon. So that gives us one of these tubes or a strip. where we need to find a delta that forces all of the f of x's near, the x's that are near x1, forces them in this tube. So for example, I could choose right here and right here. So on the board, I'm picking a delta that's almost twice as big as epsilon is. This would be x1 plus delta, x1 minus delta. So that for this particular value of x1 and this particular value of epsilon, I found a delta that gets all of the heights of the functions between x1 plus and minus uh, epsilon, I'm sorry, th uh, delta. All the x values in here have heights that fall within this tube. All right, well now let's see if we're using the same value of epsilon. So I'm going to go down one inch. This would be f of x2 minus epsilon. Say that is f of x2 plus epsilon and make our same tube. The tubes, in theory, are exactly the same width, the horizontal tubes. But now look, if I use the same value of delta, there's no way that it's going to work. If I, well, let me go ahead, should I draw it? Let me, let me draw how big our delta needs to be. Our delta is, wow, it's going to have to be really tiny. So it's going to have to be little tiny x, x2 plus delta, x2 minus delta, in order to get all the heights of the function in this tube. So as x is getting bigger, our delta is shrinking. Right? If we went farther, delta would have to be even smaller. And how small, when will it stop, stop getting smaller? As x gets bigger, it's going to need to continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller and approach zero. And I was asked once why why you don't just take look at every single value of x in the domain and, and determine a delta that will work for that particular x. If you do it for all of the x's in the domain, just take the smallest one. Maybe on some functions that will work, but in general it won't. Because, uh, just for example, this, what is the minimum? There is no minimum value of this. Okay, we'll take something smaller than the uh, infimum, the greatest lower bound, but the infimum of this is zero, and you can't pick delta equal to zero. So this picture is a pretty good example showing why one value, uh, why delta depends on where you are. If x is a small number, 
Delta can be big, but as X gets bigger, your delta has to shrink and shrink and shrink and approach zero. All right, so we will prove that f of x, which is f of x equals x squared, I'll write it again here, f of x equals x squared is not uniformly continuous on R. So I'm going to start off by writing that definition again um, of what it means to be not uniformly continuous. We will show that there exists a delta, uh, an epsilon greater than zero, such that for all delta greater than zero, the right-hand side of the uniformly continuous definition fails. We will find um, an x and a y, or there exists an x and a y, uh, maybe I, I don't even have to put in the domain since the domain is all real numbers. Uh, there exists, and maybe I will, x, y in the real numbers um, where x minus y is less than delta and or but, you can use the word but or and there, f of x minus f of y is greater than or equal to epsilon. Sorry, I had to lower that because of the, the chart there. This is simply the definition of what it means to be not uniformly continu continu continuous on R. So we're going to have to choose some things here. Um, and it turns out I can choose any value, any positive number for epsilon that I want to. I'm just going to say let epsilon equal 1. And that means then for, we're going to show for every value of delta that we choose, we can find an xy close enough that and close enough, less than delta distance, but the distance between f of x and f of y is at least epsilon. Okay, so let's just say let delta greater than zero be given. It's being chosen arbitrarily. So if we show that, if we can show the rest of this, that means it does not matter what value of delta we chose. It means for every value of delta. All right, well here, uh, this is not intuitive, uh, so it take a lot of algebra to figure out some of these numbers, but let's let x equal 1 over delta. So if we think of delta as being a small number, we just made x <clears throat> a very large number. And we're going to make y equal to 1 over delta plus delta over 2. So I think that guarantees that they are within delta of each other. Thus, x and y, they're both real numbers. And the distance between x and y is equal to, well, 1 over delta minus 1 over delta plus delta over 2 in parentheses. This is just x minus y. The 1 over deltas cancel out. We're left with negative delta over 2 in absolute values. So that's just delta over 2, which is less than delta. So this is completely true. We chose an x and a y whose distance are less than delta. Now we're going to show that f of x minus f of y in absolute values is greater than or equal to epsilon. So I'm going to write in capital letters, but f of x minus f of y, which we know it's just x squared minus y squared, And x squared minus y squared is the difference of two perfect squares, x plus y, x minus y. And I use the absolute values, breaking it apart, because that, you can do that with properties of absolute values. Well, what's this equal to? x plus y is, let's see, x plus y is going to be 1 over delta, 
plus one over delta plus delta over two, right? That's x plus y. And I'll just go ahead and write the x minus y there. And if we get two over delta plus delta over two, uh, let me let me write go to the right here. I'm going to say two over delta plus delta over two times x minus y. And maybe I'll keep going uh, to the right. That is bigger than if I just. These are two positive numbers being added together inside absolute values. So if I remove one of them, I, it, it's going to get smaller. And I'm going to call this one just 2 over delta. And now the x minus y is limited by, if I want to make it smaller, x minus y is less than delta. Delta is bigger. Um, but yeah, it's less than delta. Let me write this down. I'm trying to make it smaller. So x minus y is equal to delta over 2. Yeah, that's it. I'm not even using the fact that it's less than delta. I'm using it specifically that it's delta over 2. And that's equal to 1 which is the epsilon that we chose. So it's actually strictly greater than one. So f of x, we had x minus y in absolute values less than delta, but f of x minus f of y is greater than one. So that's the end of the proof.